We turn finally this morning to Sean Lamass, who in June 1959 succeeded Eamon de Valera as leader of the Fianna Fáil party and Taoiseach. It was the end of an era, and the beginning of another quite different era, the Lamass era. And this, despite the fact that the two men's careers had been interlocked, intertwined, since their participation in the 1916 Rising, their opposition to the treaty, the civil war, the founding of Fianna Fáil, and Lamass's participation in every de Valera-led government following the elections of 1932, 1933, 37, 38, 43, 44, 1951, and de Valera's last administration formed in 1957. In June 1959, Sean Lamass assumed the leadership of Fianna Fáil and became Taoiseach just 50 years ago. This morning, his beginnings as a politician and his relationship with de Valera. The, difficult, the main difference was complete despondency and defeatism and lack of enthusiasm for any effort amongst the supporters of the Republican movement throughout the country. Uh, now, this changed, and changed very quickly after the formation of Fianna Fáil. Uh, and uh, indeed, one of the most remarkable things that period was the speed at which the Fianna Fáil organisation came into existence from nothing into a nationwide organisation. Uh, this was partly an effort of organisation, but it was mainly attributable to the revival of spirit which was very very about another. It would be the dawn of a new day for Ireland. He was a strange looking character. I've said this before. Le Mas on de Valera. He wore a knickerbocker trousers and a tweed hat. With his enormous height and uh, exceptional thinness, he looked quite a, an unusual character. And my first impression of him was one of surprise at his un unconventional appearance. But of course, it's when he began to speak to us, his extraordinary personality began to take over. And I began to realize that we had here a very exceptional person. A verdict which could be made of Sean Lamass, and was made of him by his one-time running mate, John McCann. He was very thin, very handsome, not as handsome as, as his brother Noel, who was, who was one of the people who was a victim of the Civil War, found on the roadside. But uh, uh, he was very, very lively. When I met him in 26, and when I became rather intimate with him in 1927, he used to wear riding breeches. He skipped around. He wore a, in, in the wintertime, a, a belted coat and a, a cap, peak cap, and a cap at a rather, what do you say, a rakish angle. But he always carried a, a Nash plant with a, a right-angled ha handle, if you know what I mean. Uh, tucked under the arm. And well, many a time I saw him going down Georgia Street, I think he was going to meet Kathleen Hughes at that time. That was his wife. Oh, there was no harder worker than Shan Lamass. Uh, in my opinion, I, I never met a harder worker in politics. <clears throat> he was, to, to use that hackney, that horrible word perhaps, uh, dedicated. It, it, it was outside of his, his wife and home. Uh, it was his whole life to see this program that he had visualized and uh, uh, put into effect eventually. And every nerve was strained with, with that with that in view. He was a rather... The man wouldn't talk a lot to you. He was all business, if you know. I mean, that's, that's an expression which conveys a whole lot. Yeah. He, he was all business. Was he impatient with people who weren't as industrious as himself or as efficient as himself? No, I wouldn't say he was impatient. Not for a moment. I've seen him in... I was on the National Executive in Fianna Fáil in 1927. I represented the South, uh, city constituency. And the, the one thing I always... Uh, the, the first thing I observed about him was that he could sit and listen and listen for a long, long time. He was very young, of course, and there were all our men talking. But he'd smoke the pipe, and eventually then, at the end of it all, uh, he'd rise. And he'd probably say, yes, well, in my opinion, this is what we've got to do. Well, my earliest recollections, of course, were shortly before and during the Civil War. A founding member of Fianna Fáil, Robert Briscoe, TD. As I've always said, while we were very good friends and very close, he was a very reticent kind of an individual. Some days he would talk and some days he wouldn't, depending upon what was in his mind. Do you think he, he was a potential leader then? Or? Well, we had one leader then, and uh, we didn't think in others as leaders. We were a team, and we regarded a man like Lamas as uh, 
an important person on the team. As choices presented, one can see in so many instances that Le Mans usually took the pragmatic line. Oh, he had played a very important part. There were numbers of what we called officers of the organization, uh, like Le Mans, McEntee, Kerry Boland, people like that. They played a very important part. Every move was made after consultation with what was called the executive of the Free Nepal Party. You see, one must look at Le Mans not as an individual of ambition for himself or for position, but you must look upon him as a man who felt that there was a certain line to be followed all the time. And they, they did so. Of course, one has to all the time remember that behind the scenes and in front of the, of the public, the spokesman and the man who, if you like, who influenced decisions was uh, De Valier. I wouldn't say he was, I wouldn't say he was rough, but he hadn't a very much time for, for, for people who'd be complaining. I mean, there was a job to be got on with. He didn't put his arm around your shoulder and say, would you ever go and do this? He'd say, uh, that's what you've got to do. Go and do it. You see? Uh, that was my... He was... Uh, I always considered that he brought uh, military methods into politics. Uh, rather kindly military methods, if you like, but he had everything... Everything was, was, was in the nature of a disciplinary task which had to be done and not to be complained about. The organization, when it was founded, had its head offices in Dublin, and it had to try and organize the whole country into falling in line with this new policy. And there were several men, spokesmen, who went around all over the country, but amongst them was Lamas, who was probably the most active, the most active in that sense. He was a secretary of the, of the organization. He was in charge of the organization, and he, no doubt about it, he tried to organize every village in the village of every town, into accepting this new policy. Well, in politics, uh, he, he didn't start as a professional, because at that time, in around 26, 27, 28, when I was director of publicity, he was working, still working, in his father's shop. Uh, which was uh, a well-known gents outfitters in Cable Street. Uh, and I remember vividly going to him, uh, and he at the end of the counter, the way down with doing something on the books, and I going down to, the, to him with uh, some copy which I would have written, not a very, very involved copy, but some, some simple slogans or handbills, that's the type of thing we used to use. And he'd, okay, he'd say, that's okay, Jeff. And uh, then I'd go on from there down to Oscar Trainer, who worked uh, under it with Mr. Kingston. Mr. Kingston owned the Fowler Press down in, in uh, Basin the Gate Theatre, Frederick Lane, I think they, they call it. And uh, at that time of the day, he, he, he walked between the shop and headquarters. It, I don't know at what particular date, but it was some time late in the 20s when they prevailed upon him then to come over as uh, a full-time more or less general secretary and uh, he was everything. Had he much influence, do you think, on De Valera and on particular questions like going into the Doyle, say, in 27? Well, I think he would have been practical in that. that he, he wasn't the first. The first to say, to say, come on and capture the doll was a man who seceded from Fianna Fáil. When I say seceded, he, well, he said that he thought this was the better way to do it, that that we'd never get anywhere after the Civil War unless we went into the Thal. And uh, he, was, he was right, of course. Uh, de Valera had to concede later that he was right. That man was Michael O'Malan. You, you never fully realize all our aims in life, and no doubt there are many aspects of national development in which uh, our progress was slower than I'd hoped it would be. Uh, many things that we have not yet been able to tackle that were sort of ideas in our minds but never materialized in the form of concrete plans. Well, he came in in the spring of 1932. Historian of the Lamas years, Professor Joe Lee. Uh, facing an international recession, uh, inheriting an 
there were about 110,000 workers employed in Irish industry at the time. Industrial exports were very limited, only a very small number of firms were capable of exporting. Employment was declining in uh, quite a number of industries because of the contraction of the home market in the face of the slump. So he faced a prospect of continuing depression in industry, uh, of no apparent right of income, uh, of no industrial infrastructure being built up, and of really no prospects for the foreseeable future for industrializing the Irish economy. Erecting tariff barriers behind which Irish industry might be sheltered and might prosper. This was the national policy. When he was imprisoned in 1920, his reading consisted largely of the works of Arthur Griffith, who himself based his protectionist ideas on those of the famous um, German economist Friedrich List. T.K. Whitaker. So there was no doubt at all that Lamas was intellectually committed to a policy of protection. Uh, we provided for the imposition of tariffs on those goods which we thought could be made here. In fact, one of our slogans was that, <laughs> that so long as Irish hands are idle, nothing that can be made here or grown here will be imported into this country. Obviously, the employers who established firms uh, behind the protective barriers reckoned they were onto a good thing. Historian Joe Lee again. They were guaranteed a home market. They didn't have to meet international standards. Uh, naturally, they saw the chance to make quick profits. The goods could be relatively shoddy. There was no way of policing them at that stage until the Department of Industrial Commerce itself began to impose standards on them. So uh, Irish shoes, for instance, were notoriously inferior uh, to the best imported shoes and at higher prices. It was a very natural human reaction. And I think probably the case is that this simply wasn't foreseen sufficiently in 1932, or if it was foreseen, the higher priority of creating jobs almost at any price took precedence over the um, question of efficiency at that stage. That could come later when the jobs had been created in the first place. And more to mark the beginning of the Lamas era in June 1959 next Sunday.